Welcome to Your Music Saved Us, where two friends blast ourselves into the past to relive and recontextualize the alternative Christian music we grew up listening to in the 1990s. My name is Jay. I'm Clifton. And Clifton, what are we listening to this week? Well, Q-U-A-I-L is a a bird that some people like to hunt. And Q-U-A-L-I-A are individual, like, subjective experiences. Like, whoa, when I see green, am I seeing the same green as you are, man? And then Q-U-A... Y-L-E is the name of a former vice president known for being particularly dim-witted. One might say like a bird. <laughs> but for some reason, it's also the name of a, that a band uses when they've abandoned the name Spud Puddle and the name of their first album, which we're discussing today. Did I say quail? It's pronounced like the bird. Quail. <laughs> nice. Okay. Good. That was a good <laughs> intro. Uh- <laughs> So, I mean, <laughs> I, 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 you're going to have to edit some of this out. But the next question I have is, how did this make you feel? Um, so at first, honestly, uncomfortable because, you know, well, when we started this podcast, I thought there'd be a lot of topics we thought of, we'd talk about. And I didn't think that the well we would return to over and over again would be misogyny and lyrics. <laughs> I guess I should have expected that. But I didn't. It was no, a blind spot, maybe. I no was not expecting that either. Yeah. To be fair. <laughs> now I will say that as I dug into these lyrics again, you know, twenty four years later, it's more just a breakup album. I think it's less misogynistic than I than I first thought it was when I was listening to it again the other, the other day. You know, so some of those troubling things that stood out to me at first really do seem rooted in specific situations and experiences for this. So it's probably not as troubling as I thought it was going to be. And. Just to clarify, this is on Spotify, right? It was super easy to listen to. No. (laughs) So this is three episodes in a row that wouldn't be possible if we didn't have the physical CDs. And that's kind of getting crazy. Right. Actually, there is a like a lower quality playlist on YouTube of this album, but it's missing for some reason the last song. (laughs) I don't know why someone doesn't like Superman's son for some reason. So I uploaded the entire album on our YouTube channel. And it sounds good, by the way. It does. If you want to hear it. Okay, Clifton, so tell us a bit about Quail, who used to be Spud Puddle, who might have been someone else. I don't know. Tell us about them. Sure, yeah. So sometime during the mid-90s, four high school students in Orange County, California, got together to form a band. And that only happened once. (laughs) Only once. Yep. That wasn't every 90s band that you heard. No, no, I'm joking. Okay. So in 1994, Nick Garrisey, Javier Hernandez, William Coker, and Kevin Pollard, I think students at Whittier High School, a small Orange County suburb, um, formed like a, basically a pop punk band that would become known as Spud Puddle. In an interview with uh, the Daily Titan, uh, Nick, the lead singer, said, we haven't really worked for it for anything. We got signed right away because we're catchy. <laughs> That might say a lot for what happened in Orange County for a lot of bands, honestly. <laughs> so in 1996, the guys released their first album, uh, Linoleum, on Gene Eugene and Joe Taylor's record label Brainstorm Artists International to mostly silence. It didn't, didn't get much attention, if, if any at all, really. Definitely no critical attention. I, I, I couldn't find it written up in any of the magazines or anything like that. So, But also at that point, there were... I don't think like the seven ball had really started at that point, for example. It's a good album. It has some good standout tracks, honestly. I think the easiest way to sum it up is to say it's pop punk, but it's really not. It has a good helping of alternative influences from the day, and, and Nick's vocals really make it distinctive, um, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. So Brainstorm ceased to exist before the end of 1996, their last release actually being that uh, Lassia, Lassia Foundation's first album. So they were without a record label. And it might not surprise one to learn that there wasn't a lot of information about this band, but it seems like I couldn't find that they toured in support of that album, for example. But it does look like they played Cornerstone 1996, which sounds, man, it, it, 
everyone plays Cornerstone. I, I wish I was at Cornerstone 1996. That seems like a really good year. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I. Yeah. That was my first year to go to Cornerstone. Right. But I did yeah. Not see. Sp- Spud- they were still Spud Puddle. Yeah, at that time. Yes. I don't really know what happens there. I, I think just reading around, I'll come up on it a bit later. But I think these guys are, you know, they're in school, and so they're not really like full time in this band with on the road, you know. So they're, you know, so it's not getting kind of the kind of attention I think some other bands were getting. And when you say school, you mean high school, right? At this point, yes. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, because when when the when this album comes out, Nick, who is the youngest person in the band, is eighteen. Wow. So. Second yeah. album yeah. and you're 18. Okay. Wow. Yep. So in 1997, the new lab- label Sublime uh, was, was advertising a new album by Spud Puddle and Seven Ball after the su- successful release of their first albums by uh, you know, Cosmos Express, Fold Zendor, and Honey. But we didn't get a second Spud Puddle album. The guys recorded this album at uh, Front Page Studios in Burbank, California, according to the old Angel Fire website, Christian Rock Central, which is a surprisingly useful website that we have bookmarked. The recording was helmed by the seemingly omnipresent Michael Knott, who, I will say, did a fantastic job. He did. It sounds better than the Spud Puddle album, for sure. It does, yes. Mike had some high praise for Nick, saying that he was one of the best singer-songwriters he had ever worked with. So, the band, I guess because they wanted to create some separation in their identity from their old sound, which really isn't all that different from their new sound in this album, but also because they didn't want to get confused with the hardcore punk band Spud Gun, which wasn't really going to be a problem either because Spud Gun changed their name at this exact same time <laughs> to World Against World. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> and, and in my personal speculation, because of a youthful ignorance on the, un, on, you know, on the importance of building a name and a brand, they changed their name at the last minute. But let's be honest, like Spud Puddle was not a great name. Yes, it is. It's awesome. I'm... <laughs> I'm not going to say quail <laughs> is good either, but yeah. as a 14 year old spud puddle is a cool band name, but yeah, yeah when, you great. know, even when you're 18, you're probably already regretting that. So to be fair, to I them, can see I that. get it. You know, I can see that. I, I have, a, I have more thoughts on that. We'll talk about it later. So, but sublime had been advertising a new spud puddle album. What gets me here is that they didn't even have the name quail ready. Like it's not like they were tempted away from their name by a better name. They decided to change their name and then went out about asking friends what they changed their name to. Someone suggested Quell, and for some reason, the guys liked it. It's not horrible. It's not internet friendly for sure. And that brings us to the end here. I, you know, literally, they changed their name, I think, after they recorded the album. So it's while the album is being put together to be released that they changed their name. And that brings us to uh, the release of the album, which is according to the Christian Music Archive, released on September 23rd, 1997. And according to the 90s Christian Music Recovery Group on Facebook, it does look like they actually did do a national tour for, to, in support of this album with a Fold San- Zandora and Stave Zaker. For some reason, Stave Zaker? I don't know why. Hmm. So. Yeah, it seems like a weird matchup. Possibly they had just graduated, for, or Nick at least had just graduated from high school and they were able to tour more, maybe. Yeah, because they didn't do it until the next year, in 1998. Okay, makes sense. Although at that point, they were in college, from what I understand. And so I don't think they ever really like did the band full-time like that. You know, It was kind of just a, you know, they were in school full-time. So thinking back, you know, how did you find Quail? What was your first experience with them? <laughs> so, okay. You know how like some strip malls have Kmarts in them? And other strip malls have like liquor stores and radio shacks in them. Yes. <laughs> okay. The Christian bookstore I usually talk about was in one of those Kmart strip malls. But there was another Christian bookstore in my hometown in one of those liquor store and radio shack strip malls. <laughs> it was smaller, it was crammed together and claustrophobic. I think the entire thing honestly could fit in just the music section at the big store. You know, it was poorly lit and it seemed like no one ever worked there. And in my memories, for some reason, everything I was ever interested in was always on the bottom shelf. I remember sitting on the floor of this place. That's, you know, mm-hmm. we visited the big store because it was nice and comfy and brightly lit and all that kind of stuff. Probably a couple times a week. But every once in a while, we'd venture over to the smaller, darker store. That store, not the big one, had Spaz with a P, the Prayer Chain, Push Start Wagon, and Spud Puddle. Now, just to... Pause for a second, because we had a similar type thing in my town. 
Mm -hmm. um, kind of the bigger Christian bookstore that had things, but then there was a smaller one that, yeah, it, I don't know that they had more. It was just no one ever bought <laughs> the stuff that was there. So yes. you could find stuff like this occasionally. Interesting. Um, and sometimes you'd find it two years later because it's been sitting there the whole time. Yes. Um, and usually you could find it on sale, which was uh -huh. also pretty helpful. Exactly. Yes. That's what was going on here. Okay. Too. Okay. Yeah. So that, that, yeah. that's Although I will say it was just smaller. Like it was just a lot smaller and there was less things there. Right. Like I remember them only having like one copy of albums a lot of times. Okay. So I didn't buy Spud, Spud Puddle. My friend Stuart, who uh, was a lot more willing to take chances on things we hadn't listened to before, bought Spud Puddle. But honestly, a lot of times if one of us owned something, that was good enough, you know? Right. So I remember going over to his house and listening to the album. Kind of a lot of my memories of a lot of first albums, honestly, because for some reason he had a sound system in his room at 16 years old, 15 years old, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. 15 years old. Well, this didn't shoot to the top of my list of uh, favorite bands, I, I enjoyed it. It was unique for things I'd heard at the time, you know. Like I said earlier, they're kind of pop punk. And they do harmonies. It wasn't your, your typical three-part harmony that you'd heard from, you know, MXPX and Goaty Hook. Songs had different tempos, you know. It's like not, not like every song was faster than the one before. And their guitars were different. They were like less aggressive and had more texture going on to them. But as unique as I found it, I'm not going to lie, 15-year-old mm, Clifton was not, was a bit turned off that each song wasn't faster than the one before. And it was catchy, but it wasn't like catchy in what I was looking for at the time. So it kind of just faded into the background, honestly. But the next year when I saw the record label that put out Cosmos Express and Silage advertising a new album by Spud Puddle, I was genuinely excited. My taste had grown a bit. I thought, you know, if this album, you know, was a step forward for the band and it brought some of the sophistication that Cosmos Express had, I, I you know, I, I was, I thought I'd like it. I was looking forward to it. I also remember having the posters in my room before it even came out. Um, I've mentioned before that a friend's mom worked at uh, the big um, Christian bookstore in town and Sublime sent out these like 12 by 12 posters, like cardstock type posters that had like the album cover on the front and maybe a picture on the back. And I remember having like the Cosmos Express one, their first album. I went later on the second album, but at this time, the first album. And I remember uh, the Quell one, you know, had their the album cover on the front and then that picture of them, that, that word picture of them with the aluminum foil background on the back, um, you know, looking like a nerds posed as a pretty boy rock stars. So I have that in my room. Um, and I bought it immediately upon, upon release, as far as I remember. And it didn't take spelunking at the small bookstore this time. It was actually released uh, at the big bookstore. And I assume that Sublime advertised that this was Spud Puddle, because I knew, like, there was no, I never had confusion. I knew, always knew that this was Spud Puddle. So I listened to this album a lot. You know, the songs are catchy, full of, you know, angsty teenage emotions, perfect for 16 or 17 year old Clifton, always like love Lauren and lost in his own world. I listened to it right through the end of my senior year, as far as I remember. I, I remember uh, being high enough at the coffee shop I worked at when we closed. I got to uh, pick the cleanup music after we closed. And this was in my rotation, you know, clear until I graduated and left that job two years later. I also remember that Nick went on to be in fan mail because I remember his very distinct vocals showing up in the background of songs for fan mail. And also, you know, you mentioned last week with Mer Baby is that it was kind of like an album that you listened to, but didn't really listen to with anyone else. And that's how this album was with me. Like, even though I discovered Spud Puddle with Stuart, 
I don't remember listening to this album with anyone else ever. It was just one of those ones that I listened to. So, Jay, did you come across Spud Poller or Quail back in the day? Yes. <laughs> uh, it's funny because I, I re-listened to Spud Puddle before this, just just briefly, and mm-hmm. I realized, yeah, I had a friend that had that album. I never had it, but I definitely recognized some of the songs. Okay. Um. So it must have been one of those things, just like you were saying, you went over to Stuart's house, we must have gotten together and listened to it. Yeah. But as far as Quail goes, I, I kind of have a confession to make. <laughs> And okay. uh, this will not surprise Clifton, but and it probably may not surprise the listeners <laughs> either. But I guess I'm kind of an asshole. And uh, I was I got snobby about some of these labels already early on, even at this point. And allow me to digress just for a second, because this will probably <laughs> affect some of the other albums we talk about on here. But, you know, I grew up listening to Christian music quite a while. Like I was the nerd that even in like fifth grade had a subscription to CCM magazine, you know, like (laughs) that stuff loved DC talk bands like that early on, Mm -hmm. you know, when I'm like 12. And, but I remember as I, my musical taste grew and got better. I also watched how a lot of these kind of regular, I would say regular contemporary Christian labels started trying Mm -hmm. to bring in, the alt- kind of alternative bands and especially as the style changed both, you know, kind of in the secular and Christian world. Mm-hmm. And so I got kind of, it's funny because it, it was a young age, but I got kind of snobby about stuff. And I remember <laughs> seeing sublime records and being like, Hmm, division of Brentwood music group. Those are the <laughs> ones that put out like, Kathy Tricoli and Brian Duncan and all these regular Christian artisans like and Clay Cross and all this garbage. Well, I thought apologies if anybody out there likes them, but um, people I thought were garbage and was just like, nope, kind of thumbs down um, kind of thing without giving it <laughs> a fair shake. And I think part of that comes from like and Clifton, I think it was kind of this way for you too. Like we didn't really have like a local music scene. Like when we were talking to Sean mm-hmm. from Rainy Days, like that's how he actually knew a lot of this music and bands because right. they played there, either on tour or they were just local. Mm-hmm. But you know, I'm more coming at it as I guess a consumer, really. Um, and so I see these labels kind of coming out of nowhere, and it seems like they're just trying to capitalize on what's big at the time. <laughs> And I don't think, like, my take on it, I don't think was completely wrong, but I wasn't seeing the whole picture no. because, like, you know, if I'm in Quail's perspective and some upstart label that, sure, is funded by some kind of traditional Christian label, but they want to put money towards my band and release our album, you're going to say yes. Right. Th- that's fine. All that to say, long story short, I guess my <laughs> discerning taste <laughs> at the time (laughs) kept me from really examining too much on sublime i did Hmm. listen to silage i remember that first album a little bit but for some reason i skipped quail i think i just saw it i don't think i knew the connection to to spud puddle and i think i saw it and just like no it just looks like some regular alternative Hmm. rock band interesting and skipped over it and i will tell you i did kind of miss out because i really enjoyed listening to this oh good so yeah, why don't like I know you've done some research before we jump into the album, tell us a little bit more <laughs> about the label that I didn't give a chance because I was an asshole. <laughs> yeah. So you're yeah, you're not wrong. So <laughs> So Sublime is actually a sub label of Essential Records, which are part of the Brentwood Music Group, who was a division of Zumba Music Group, which is part of the Sony Music Empire. <laughs> you like that, everyone? So yeah, I mean this is definitely a someone entering the market to why because why not right but you know i kind of looked at it a little bit differently at the time i think okay you know i was snobby in some of the, some of the same ways right like if i'm listening to a punk album it's probably going to be from a punk record label or something like that right but with this which is more just poppy kind of stuff i'm I'm happy to listen to it on whatever they want to bring it to us through you know and and to a certain extent it's like the more record labels there are the more music someone's gonna throw at me right you know? yeah no that's very true yeah yeah, and, and looking at it from today's perspective, if like if I was one of those artists, because this is part of the Sony Music Group, you know, you you can you can actually look at Essential Records and look at Jars of Clay, for example. They're they're the big like one of the big uh, uh, the Essential album or Essential bands, and 
being part of the Sony Music Empire gives them exposure not just to the music or, or to the Christian music community, but also to mainstream exposure, you know? And so I think that may have tempted these bands. If you actually, if you actually look at who was on um, Sublime, I think a lot of them were looking for that kind of thing. And they were, and, and that's kind of what, in my, I, I, in my estimation, that's kind of what Brandon Ebel tried to do with like, like BEC later on, you know, yeah, was kind of create something that did ha- that could be more easily exposed to both, to both sides without just being pigeonholed as just, you know, just a Christian thing, you know? Um, and so I think, you know, I don't, I never, I never have a problem with that, but let, let me, let me actually do. So I will give you a little history here. Um, this came from Tony S from the nineties Christian music recovery group. He, uh, he worked for uh, so, uh, Sublime and Essential back in the day. He said, Robert Benson, who ran Essential, wanted to start an alternative label and market the label as a brand with the artist, kind of like Tooth & Nail. He hired his friend and former bandmate from Uthonda to do A&R and five fine bands, Bob Wohler. Some great bands and great people at the label. I think it just came off as a little forced and lacked the indie cred needed at the time to get enough traction to to get the mer- parent company Provident to keep funding it. Now I don't know who Provident is because that's a whole other company that didn't come up in my research of the levels of this thing. Right. <laughs> but yeah, you know, so I can I can see there that yeah, you know, it's it's true. It's not just an indie label, but like I said, uh, you know, I I you know for just general pop music like this, I wasn't going to be too snobby about it well and again if you're the band and they're like we're going to give you money to make this album mike Knott's going to produce it <laughs> awesome who says no to that right exactly yeah <laughs> yeah so uh, there's also something you know just to, to to feel a little bit better about uh, sublime um melissa s also from uh, the 90s christian recovery group on facebook uh, was an intern at essential from 1998 2000 she said that they worked they they worked those albums um, from Sublime after it was shut down, but she also said that they were very friendly people and they treated her very well. They, they for example, she said that they took her to like the studio to watch a, a a record get mixed and things like that. You know, with you don't have to you know that's not something you have to deal with an intern. You know, you can send interns to get coffee and 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 be your slave. You know, but they actually took her and like, exposed her to the industry really well. I, I did find that uh, Sublime, for as small and short lived as it was, it does have a Wikipedia page for some reason. <laughs> And of all their artists, Quill is the only one that doesn't have its own Wikipedia page. I am surprised how little there is on the internet mm-hmm. for Quail. Um, well, and Spud Puddle together. Um, right, yes. But we can, I research them together. We can talk more about it, kind of what they're doing now at the end. Yeah. Um, but, okay, so getting back to this, you know, what did you expect before you listened to this again? <laughs> Honestly, I was nervous. Like, I, I don't think I've revisited quell in a long time and i was nervous that the music was going to be simple and boring and vapid you know because there's a reason that kind of saccharine loving 15 year old clifton was alone among his friends like in this album right so <laughs> i was worried that the production was going to be bad and like it would be like all squilchy and unlistenable i don't know why i just in my head it was like had this like tin can sound to it um, and I was nervous enough that I actually didn't dive straight into Quill. I, I, like you, I listened to Spud Puddle as well um, before before I revisited this album. And it was better than I remember, you know? Nick's voice was great. So I continued on to Quill, and, and uh, yeah, th- thankfully it was it was good. The production, like I said, was great. Mike Knott did a great job. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. But, yeah, it's just re- really good, I think, yeah. What, what, what was your kind of first reaction to it? Well, it was definitely better than... <laughs> Because I still had my, you know, <laughs> I had my little mind made up about Sublime Records. Um, mm-hmm. It was definitely better than I thought. And I like his vocals. Mm-hmm. And you know what it made me think of was the band Silver Sun Pickups. Interesting. <laughs> but then I listened to them later and it was like, well, eh, yeah. it's not completely wrong, but it maybe wasn't the closest right. thing. But at least the yeah. vocals made me think of that. Mm-hmm. I liked it. My even my initial reaction, the first song, I was like, "Oh, this is not going to be a slog <laughs> to listen to." You know, this will be fine. I can do this. This is good. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, like I said, I was actually expecting it to be a little bit boring, but it wasn't. I, I really, I really enjoyed it. You know, you know, to kind of kind of dive in here a little bit. I, I, so, like, like I say, the Spud Puddle was actually less punk than I remember them being. And there's even there's even a song on like that that Spud Puddle album that sounds like Plank Eye. You know, it's like all, kind of like an alternative grunge post grunge type thing. And, you know, with Quail changing their name from Spud Puddle to Quail to separate themselves from this old sound, there just wasn't that big a difference in sound, right? Right. I mean, 
yeah, okay, there's a few straight out punk songs on on Linoleum, but like two. It felt like to me they more just kind of like sanded down the rough edges yeah. of Spud Puddle. I think this is a pure we, they've just progressed a year later. Right. They're just you know? a better band. Yeah. They are just a better band, right? Maybe a little bit more refined, maybe a little bit more focused, but they're just a better band, you know? So I didn't really see the reason for the name change, you know? <laughs> and as, as, as I said before, you know, I, I kind of found their, their style kind of unique among what I had been exposed to back in the late 90s. And I didn't really have, you know, the experience to understand the influences or describe it. But now I'm going to take a shot at it. So Quill is typically has kind of like a well, like a wall of sound kind of fuzzy ish guitars but not fuzzy kind of like like Mer Babies had last last episode right this is more wall of sound fuzz where it's 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 it does get loud and quiet you know <laughs> but it also has a little bit more Brit- british tone to it i think that's just the guitar texture the, the guitar uh, tones that they're using that gives it more of a british t- uh, tone to it it feels influenced by brit pop but i don't think it actually is but it does you know have a lot of just the the typical indie rock sounds of the time mixed, you know, basically with alternative and punk. I think the songwriting is fairly catchy, but one thing I've noticed is that they don't really use hooks. You know, it, it's more just that the songs in general as a whole are catchy and the vocals do a lot of the grabbing you uh, for the songs. Reading reviews around, around the web, I saw people compare them to Sunday Real Estate and Knapsack and Radiohead and Foo Fighters and Super Drag. I don't know. Like, I can see... I don't see the Radiohead thing at all, first off, right? Yeah. The other ones, eh, a little bit here and there, you know? There's a spot uh, in Man on the Moon where I noticed some similarities between what the guitars were doing between these guys and what, like, Knapsack or Sam I Am did at the time. But not even what Knapsack, for example, was doing on their 1995 album, Silver Sun Sweepstakes. It's more what Knapsack was doing on their 1997 album, which came out at the same time as this one, honestly. Right. So it's hard to really say that's an influence. I mean, so Knapsack was in California, but they were up in Sacramento. They weren't down in, in Orange County. Maybe they played there. I don't know, right? On Forget Me 5, I really noticed that there's a, a big... You can kind of hear similarities between Nick's voice and Jeremy Enoch kind of there. But really, you know, I don't know. Even with the knapsack and sunny real estate, this isn't emo, but it has emo elements. So it's hard to really nail down what this album is stylistically. Yeah, I can hear the knapsack a little bit, also kind of in the just the fuzzy guitars. Mm -hmm. Foo Fighters a little bit too. Yeah, a little bit. Same kind of crunchy guitar. Yeah, you're right. It's not. It's definitely not emo. Like, no. It's not. It's not necessarily super far away, but it's not. It's too. It's much pop. It's poppier. Mm-hmm. It's. It's not punk enough. Yeah, it's more just yeah. like alternative rock. And I know when you say that, sometimes that can mean a lot of things. But yeah, this is to me that in in not in a good way. This kind of fits that. Go, speaking of those vocals of of Nick's, they are distinct. I took a long time for how to describe them. <laughs> So what I came up with is there's kind of a graveliness, not really like, not really like the, you know, the I'm Batman, not, not really that, (laughs) right? But more just like a higher pitched graveliness. But there's also some nasal in there. And also like he sometimes has like an emotional lisp. Well, you're gonna have to hear it, but you're either going to love it or hate it. You're not going to be meh on these, on these vocals, I don't think. (laughs) Shining dark out at the pretty boy with the twisted head, he runs loud and steady. Pretty boy knows that her mind's made up, she's gonna leave for dead. Walk on them again. Yeah, I, I really like it. Um, I think it makes it pretty unique. The, the only problem, though, with it, and, and especially with the way he's kind of 
I, I like sequ- sequence some of the lyrics like throughout mm-hmm. it. It's not, I, I would, I'll just say I was really grateful to have the lyric sheet for this. Cause this, <laughs> unlike Mer babies where we can make out, you know, 95% yeah. of the album, this one is definitely more of a struggle Yes, without the lyrics. Yeah. Nick definitely, you know, I, I, I guess you can, you know, compare him to Jeremy Nick there where he definitely like strings out and slurs and mumbles, you know, his, his, vo- his lyrics, you know, so they're not all just jumping out to get you, you know? <laughs> right. But there are more jumping out to get you than Sunny Day Real Estate, honestly. Or no, at least those for first sure. two. There's first two Sunny Day Real Estate albums, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Of course, that's a low bar, but yes. It is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's dive into the first song here. Yep. So having become a bit sensitive to, to it in listening to these albums, on this re-listen with the first line being, He was a loner. My first thought was, oh, no, I don't need some incel shit with this album. <laughs> so the, the good news is that this person, who the loner is, is definitely not the hero of this song. He's not being praised. He's not being celebrated. He's kind of the villain of his own story here. So that was nice. After that first line kind of shocked me really fast. <laughs> I was like, just froze for a moment. So the first two verses are, are he was a loner with common sense and nothing else, follows a group of haters beyond his self-esteem and self, denying lies and truth with many times to clear things up, back to the same old routine of drinking lies and refilling their cups. I don't remember 16-year-old Clifton taking a lot of meaning from this song. I liked it musically, but I think I've said, you know, that I wrote their lyrics in like the spiral of, you know, the margins of my spiral while not taking notes in class, but this was not one of those songs that I did that with. (laughs) But looking at it today, today in 2021, I read that and I'm like, oh, that's incel culture, right? (laughs) Well, you know, I saw your notes before we did this and I, it made me laugh because I thought, oh my gosh, he's right on. Because when I originally looked at this and I noticed that, you know, 16 year old Jay would have a tendency to do this too. I'm looking for anything that seems like it's talking about God. Right. So in, you know, I don't know, what is it, third verse or something? Well, who was there to help him in his time of lowered mm-hmm. self? Too cheap to tell the whole truth, too many wise to keep lying. I thought, oh, that who was there to help him? He needs God. This is a song about this person <laughs> needing God. But yeah. when you put the rest of what you pointed out together, it honestly sounds uh, <laughs> yeah, more like incel, or I even thought people who follow QAnon, possibly <laughs> this could be about them. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, I I really like the the line in, in in the first verse that says "with common sense and nothing else." And I, I do remember that line from when I was a kid. I, I like that. You know, it see it seems to me this is one of my pet peeves, really, as a person that the common understanding for what common sense means has fallen off some kind of cliff over the last couple of decades. <laughs> common sense, everybody, is common. It's innate. It isn't special. And it often doesn't appeal to the better parts of human nature. Revenge, for example, is common sense. A system of justice to short-circuit the need for revenge is the opposite of common sense. It might seem common because it's part of our lives, but it's not. <laughs> you know? And these, I think these lyrics capture that, because a loner with common sense and nothing else is, in fact, more likely to fall in with a group of haters and liars. That person wouldn't have the support of people with other perspectives or the hard-minded rational thinking that would warn them away from that kind of thinking. And that's, yeah, that's kind of where I get the incel thing from, maybe where you get the QAnon thing from, is because this is the kind of person that's describing. (laughs) Drinking lies and refilling their cups. Yep. Of course, this was written in, what, 97? But, you know. Yeah. Yes. No, and I know. Because, yeah, I I have a lot. Somewhere in my notes I wrote, oh, yeah, with the line, with many times to clear things up, 
And then, of course, that's immediately follow, followed by what I just said, you know, back to the same old routine of drinking lies and refilling their cups. I wrote, it's YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you you went through the second verse there, and so I, I I don't think, and I as a kid I did the same thing for you. I'm like, okay, how is this talking about God? How is this talking about someone having a relationship with God? I didn't see that in it. I probably just went, okay, next. Yeah, I probably didn't spend a lot of time trying to understand what he was talking about here. But yeah, it, it's it's an interesting song to start off the album with. The bridge, I think, also does a great job combined, you know, musically and lyrically of giving up. You know, it it, it has like this giving up. And returning to his his life life of lies, it says the the, the lyrics are not this time because I'll lie. Right. This is another another time to set things straight, but not this time. I'll just lie. You know, I, I think that it's, you know, it's it's one of those moments in the album that that musically works with the lyrics and 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 pulls off something really well. It, it's a great song. It's it's a good song. It's a good say it's a good song, and it's a good starter for the album. But it's I don't think it's one of my favorites. I'm with you. I liked it, and it yeah. was a good introduction to the band for me. But oh yeah, it's not it's not my favorite. Now speaking of the next song, the Pretender. This is the only song on the album with a video, and it seems to be the single for the album. And I think that's fair, because this is probably the one that gets stuck in my head the most out of all the songs. Really? Yeah. That's good. What'd you think of the video? Much better than I was expecting. The first, I don't know, 20 or 30 seconds, I was like, where is this going? Is this just yeah. random? They're going to be playing as a band. But then it, it kind of gets moving, and it there. well, not to spoil it for you, but, um, you know... <laughs> Spoiler, Spoiler alert, uh, it's got a, um, they kind of, all the band members take turns carrying around, it looks like an egg, mm-hmm. um, but then it lights up and seems to mm-hmm. surprise them all. And then at the <laughs> end, one of the band members brings it, it looks like maybe to band practice, mm-hmm. and then it like almost lights up or explodes or something. I think they drop it, right? And it, um, yeah. on accident, because they, they're fighting over it. Yes. And um, the the kind of the last scene is like, and this really bright, like penetrating light coming out of like the garage or the shed where they're practicing. Yeah, it's like it, it's an old, just old, old shed where they're practicing, and like the boards aren't all exactly next to each other, so like the lights escaping from between the boards, you know. And they've got some smoke in the air, so you can see the light. It's, it's honestly, yeah, b- better than some of the Christian videos that oh, I even yeah. liked at the time. Like it's not, oh a, yeah, it's not a bad video, especially for the time period, and especially probably because they didn't have a huge budget. I don't really think it has anything to do with the lyrics of the song. No, but it's a cool video. <laughs> yeah, I thought they did. They did a good job. And it's, you know, once again, I think this would be that video would have been totally at home on MTV at the, of the time. Mm-hmm. It, it would fit. Yeah. Yep. So, as you said, lyrically, the, I don't know what the egg lighting up has to do with the, with the, with this song. So the and, and weird, weirdly, so the song starts off kind of with this liar motif again. It says it says, I don't want you to know if I'm calling on the phone. I like to leave you hanging. I like to live by lying. I don't. I don't know what that's about. Um, well, yeah, and the and the title of the song is "The Pretender," so it does right, seem it to be is. this kind of lying thing. But then when you shift into the chorus, it almost seems yes. like a different song, you know, a little bit, right? Yeah. And so the chorus is, "But I got a smile like the sun because you sh- because she smiles like the sun. You smile a lot like the sun. Yes, you smile like the sun." And I think this is a this is a catchy chorus, by the way. I think this is one of the it catchiest is. parts on the album because, you, like you yeah. said earlier, they don't write a lot of really strong hooks, but this is one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and their hooks aren't aren't really momentary; they're more extended, a little less powerful, I think, you know, because they're extended. But I, but for that reason, I like them. But yeah, and I will say that sixteen old Clifton really loved this chorus, definitely. <laughs> and what I kind of took from that chorus is, for me, it was almost like reminiscent of like your crush smiling at you and you can't help but smiling back 
and like you said, the the music pairs with it perfectly to make just kind of like you know it's really bright and like the music like feels sunny. I would say you know, um, like the, like the sun's about to break through some clouds or something like that. Uh, so I, I think that's that's pretty interesting, and maybe that has to do with like the little egg flight lighting up. I don't know. Yeah, so it, it's a very happy sounding chorus, mm-hmm. but then when you read the the first verse, at least. Mm-hmm. It's it, this is not a happy topic. He's basically no. talking about lying. And again, if I don't want you to know if I'm calling on the phone, I like to leave you hanging. I mean, is is that about the same person he's singing about in the chorus? I don't know. Because if it is, it doesn't make any sense, right? Unless the whole smile thing is a facade as well. Mm-hmm. And you know, who knows? <laughs> yeah, and yeah. So this and the second verse is days go by on and on. Oh, these days are getting long. I like to see them ending and which goes into the bridge, which says, I want to stop pretending. So I think there's two ways to take this. Either this is like my interpretation, which is a crush. Um, and the, the person wants to stop pretending that there's not a crush and they just want to have a relationship or something like that. Or it's kind of after a relationship. And this person is obsessing about someone that they shouldn't be obsessing about. Hmm. Either way, I'm going to say that I don't want you to know if I'm calling on the phone, I like to leave you hanging is weird yeah like is that like i'm calling you but i'm just breathing into the phone and not talking (laughs) (laughs) that's what i'm picturing or i'm gonna make you think that i'm calling but i'm not going to i like that but then that's like a jerk move too it is but but it's less creepy true than the uh, (laughs) than my my initial one yes okay i like that but then how's, how do either one of those have to do with the chorus? I don't know. That's what I mean. It's like two separate songs. And for me, when I was listening to it, when I was doing something else, and wasn't paying a lot of attention to the lyrics. The chorus stood out and I was like, oh, this is such a nice sounding happy song about, yeah, like a crush or something. And then when I really dove into the lyrics on the verses, mm-hmm. I was like, what? Like it, yeah, I know. It, yeah, it was strange. I will say as, as, as 16 year old Clifton just took this as a kind of a cute love lorn love song. Yeah, and, and that, but, with the chorus, that I mean, yeah. I think that fits. Let's go. Let's go on to track four. Stay away. So this, even though Pretender is definitely the the uh, the single for the album, this is one of my favorite songs from the time. There's I probably have two or three favorites that really that really are, are are my best moments in the album, and this is one of them. So to sum it up quickly, I think this is about a couple fighting, and so they go back and forth between one and the other person to stay away. Honestly, while they have a little bit of a pity party for themselves, <laughs> um, it's, a, it's kind of a, a, a sad song. Yeah, it's it, musically it's different. You know, it, it's one of the few songs that doesn't have like a wall of guitars. Um, the bass carries a lot of this for the most part. One thing I liked about it at the time is, you know, even though it's a simple song, you know, thematically, I think it, 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 there's just a lot of emotion packed into the song, which is delivered through the music. You know, you can really feel it. I think you know, there's a, there's a moment towards the end where I think it really comes to a head when Nick kind of screams over and over again, like he's kind of like begging and then all the guitars drop out and he says, you know, stay away, stay away, stay away. like this pause and then bam everything comes, comes back in and then it is a wall of sound of guitars and it's really just uh, i think it's really a, a, a really an effective it's really effectively communicating kind of just like this desperate emotional state of two people that are fighting with each other and and things aren't going well one comment i do have on this is and i noticed you had this on a few songs again he's it's not easy to make out always what he's saying and i could have sworn mm-hmm. when he says apology he was saying paula jean And I 
was trying to figure out who Paula Jean was until I read the lyrics. So I don't think I misheard that one. Yeah, that's well, interesting. You know. <laughs> I wonder if sixteen-year-old uh, Jay would have made the same mistake. Yeah, who knows? I, I would just hum along and just string together some vowel sounds and be fine with it. So you know, whatever. All right, um, let's move on to uh, uh, let's play keep away. A good part of the reason I want to talk about this song is because it starts with about as annoying as Nick's vocals get on the album, where he's like, let's play, keep away. Let's play, keep away. Let's play, keep away. It's been a long time, but hasn't been that long. Asking you to come back to Navarone. Which is also kind of a terrible, just lyrically, like, it a is. terrible way to start it. Yeah. But I really like the song. So, <laughs> and I really like the vocal turn from the Let's Play Keep Away into It's Been a Long Time, It Hasn't Been That Long. Even though that is also a terrible lyric. <laughs> But the way the vocal, like there's a, there's a slight like shift in the vocals that I, I really like for some reason. I don't, I don't know. I can't, I can't explain. It's the way the syllables stack up against each other. I think it's, it's, it's there's something that just catches me. But yeah. And you know, and then the, sorry, the next, the next line is, is actually the heartbreaking part for me, which is asking you to come back turned out wrong. Mm. You're like, Oh shit. Right. <laughs> so yeah, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty, this is a sad song. So what, yeah, help me out though. What's going on here? Cause he says, you know, asking you to come back turned out wrong. I feel yeah. like a cheater. Am I wrong? I feel like a cheater. Yeah. I mean, I can kind of get that. Maybe he wanted her back and then decided he didn't. Yeah. So what I, and there's, I, I can't claim that I completely understand all the lyrics from the song, you know, but kind of what I took is that, you know, obviously this is they're They've maybe broken up. They're trying to get back together and failing. And I think what we're what we're witnessing is kind of like the exponential bitterness that comes with you remember the good times, but then you get back together and you're like, oh, yeah, this was shitty. And so that by trying to force it, you kind of have this exponential increase in the bitterness that's between you. And so I'm wondering if like the, I feel like a cheater. Am I wrong? Is him saying like we're back together now, but I don't want to be, you know, <laughs> which makes me feel like you know, a cheater. And then, and, and then a little bit later, he says, I feel like a, a preacher. Am I wrong? I feel like a teacher. Am I wrong? Yeah. Cause he, before that, he says, if you change your ways, baby, that works best. Well, can I find out how you turn out next? If you change your ways, baby, that works best. which is one of my favorite lines in this album. <laughs> yeah. And then my like, um, kind of patriarchy, misogyny, whatever radar went off. I was like, eh, you know, a, a little, <laughs> so for me initially too, right. This is one of those things where I, where I initially was like, Oh crap, this is good. This is kind of be a toxic song. Right. <laughs> but so, so let's go, let's actually look at that. Cause, cause so this actually has some of my favorite angry kind of bitterness, bitter moments on the album. So the line right before that is, I cannot find out how you'll turn out next, which goes into my favorite line, which is, you change your ways, baby, that works best. And, and then later on, like, so there's a lyric that I misheard here the entire time. Like, I didn't know, I, I didn't get this right until I was reading it the other day, um, which is, I always heard, well, I know you've got your chains around me. Which I heard too when I read your notes and listened to the really? song again. I thought, oh, I could totally see how you got that. Yeah. But the actual lyric is, well, I know you're going to change around me. different <laughs> which comes right after him saying i cannot find out how you'll turn out next 
And so I'm wondering if it's one of these things where, you know, because of the bitterness of the relationship that they're trying to get started back again, I'm wondering if like when they, when it's the two of them, they're not treating each other with the respect and like, you know, they're just not acting like they normally would type of thing. Right. Yeah. That line hit me as one of these, oh crap, this is going to be a toxic type thing. But I think it really is rooted in a very specific thing that's going on in this song with this one person, not just a general view of, of woman, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I could see that. I also really like the, the bridge in the song is really great. It says, today I saw you, tomorrow slap me sideways. <laughs> <laughs> Which kind of, I think, supports my, uh, my general, uh, my general argument that this song is about bitterness and, and yeah. I think just on a side note, uh, you're, I think that your ideal song would be extremely bitter lyrics, but encased in a really like poppy, happy sounding, you know, yeah. tune that, that I think would be like your ideal song, right? Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you can say something really dark while you're like, like smiling. Uh-huh, and, uh... Exactly. Yeah. Like <laughs> super dark, bitter stuff, but it, like real, I mean, we were talking like really bouncy, like Bell yeah. and Sebastian type, you know, yep. something like that. Yeah. Yes, that is true. <laughs> That's the music I like. All right. Let's, let's continue on that same theme to true blue. Okay. This was probably my favorite song on the album. And listening to it now, there's there's really nothing special about it. it. You know, it's just a fairly standard breakup song. But I think once again, Nick's vocals are just kind of really on target in this song. His delivery of the second verse, for example, I want to kill this sad machine, but I realize what I'm saying, which he does make rhyme somehow. <laughs> sad machine. Sad machine. I don't know. Okay. He makes that rhyme somehow. But it, 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 that hits me in the fields. Uh, maybe it's from a lifetime of dealing with anxieties and depression, but you know, that's, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. And I, just to make sure I'm, you know, I am super dense sometimes. I mean, are we talking <laughs> about suicide right there? I don't think we're talking about suicide. Oh, I'm, I, okay. I'm just saying that <laughs> like, 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 I think that he, that he's expressing like, there seems to be like a mechanism for producing sadness in him or something like that, you know? And that he wants to get rid of that. But then he realizes what he's saying, which is to say that to get rid of that is to get rid of all the good things, too. Oh, OK. I took it more on the nose. Like, I want to kill myself, <laughs> but then I realize what I'm saying and that would be a bad idea. OK. I mean, maybe that's it. But <laughs> <laughs> once again, pretty vague song. Yeah. And a lot of these songs, and this is one, too. A lot of these songs, when you read the lyrics like it, the, the song won't pop into your head. You know, sometimes when you read mm-hmm. the lyrics, like the melody kind of comes into your head because you heard it a yeah. few times. He, the way he strings these words together, yeah. sometimes you'll be like, did I hear that song? And then you listen to it, <laughs> oh, because of the way he just puts the lines together. Yes. Yeah. And that, that, that is very, you know, Jeremy Enix, Sandy Real Estate type, type thing, you know, where, yeah, he's, he is using the words as he sees fit. Right. And breaks them apart as he sees them. Yeah, exactly. Now, he doesn't go as far as Jeremy Enoch in LP2, for example, where he just, you know, inserts random noises right. to, <laughs> to fill the empty spaces where he doesn't have lyrics. So, you know, one thing that really hit me when I was, when I was listening to this is that his vocals aren't good. Like, <laughs> and we've talked about this before, you know, I think he can sing, especially because I've listened to his, his, some other stuff from him. He can definitely sing. But you wouldn't know that by listening to this song. But for me, that's what works. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. And like, that's true of a lot of indie bands. Like, you know, like, 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 like the Promise Ring. Davey cannot sing, but it's part of what makes him work. Right. I kind of wonder, like, where, where does that aesthetic come from? Because sometimes there's also singers who can't sing and it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> But I, and I think like I used to explain to people that that 
as part of the what music I like is that like if a sing if a singer can't sing but they can make that an attribute rather than a rather than something negative You're right. if they can make a positive out of not being able to sing there's some real punk rock in that right yeah <laughs> uh, but yeah I don't know so he can't sing but it works so the end of the second chorus where the last line of the chorus is another wasted song and then it goes directly into this other line which is another a melody gone wrong I think is another another one of those like kind of really strong hitch in the feels moments on this album where where they really pull it off both you know lyrically vocally and musically where where something just hits right on We talk about man on the moon this weird song yeah and i will say as we're starting this was the one i felt like was the most christian but we'll see what you think that's interesting so other than superman's son which is mostly acoustic this is the tamest song on the album but it's also kind of one of the darkest songs on the album that said i read a review that this song is supposed to be about how pop songs are directed at worldly things but they should be directed at god hmm. but i don't see it Singing to the man on the moon, I should be singing to you. So, so far, so good, right, for that interpretation? Uh-huh. But then the next line is, she shadows her eyes. She, know it's ru- she knows it's ruined. Uh-oh. I kind of love that. That uh-oh is in the, ly- is in the lyrics, by the way. <laughs> and I kind of love it. <laughs> uh-oh. It's throughout the song, sorry. So, if it was talking about God, then why is it she shadows her eyes, she knows it's ruined? I mean, maybe he's doing something very, very deep and referring to humanity as she and... Maybe? No, I, I I'll, agree. I'll, okay. I, yeah, no. I'll I don't, buy that. I don't let's let's go is. in that direction. <laughs> so, there is the, where's one line that, that, that supports your interpretation and the, uh, the, interp- the interpretation of this reviewer, which is the last line of the second verse. So I'll, I'll do the entire second verse. But the last line here. Hold me gently now, because I'm feeling all alone. Only trembling foul from the love eternally shown. Right. That's what stood out to yeah. me. Yeah. Fair. But nothing else about this song. I think, I mean, yeah, there's the man on the moon, but then it should be singing to you. I don't know. Maybe it is about that. I mean, I can accept that. I just, if I was, re- re- if I was reading this, I think even as a 16 year old, that's not where I would have gone with my interpretation. The only other thing I got, and I would not have got this as 16-year-old, and perhaps I'm reading too much into it, but at the <laughs> end, I come and take your hand, walk across the land, which mm-hmm. sounds better in the song than it does right there. Um, <laughs> lick my lips and make it sealed. Only the truth can be revealed. That whole like mm-hmm. seal on the lips thing made me think of parts of Revelation. I mm. highly doubt that's what he's referencing, but- um, I doubt it. You never know. <laughs> yeah. But why lick your lips? Yeah. 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 I don't know. So the second time through the chorus, I don't, did you notice this? That there's a really low following Nick's just l- entire vocals for the second chorus and actually the third chorus as well. Like an octave below Nick. There, there, there is a someone, someone else following him. And, and it, to the extent that it, I think it has to be pitch shifted because it's, it's, it's even deeper than like, what's his name from Modest Mouse who does those really low lines sometimes, you know, hmm. <laughs> but it, it, you would miss it if you're if you're not listening to it loud enough. You would easily miss it, and if you're if you really just have it on the background, you would easily miss it too. But it just gives it this kind of creepy quality to it. But it's really fascinating to me because you know it does it does that, and then it goes into another verse, and then it does it again in the, in the third chorus. But then that third that third chorus w- with this really creepy lower octave backing vocal immediately goes into the the bridge that you just read, which is. 
one of my favorite moments on the album. Uh, you know, the bridge has this wonderful kind of lead guitar behind behind it, and Nick's vocals are kind of like just side of the, this side of mumbling with kind of like a wonder and contained excitement to them. It, it's very effective. It creates like this really like this really bright moment after there's this whole album kind of a heartbreak. And then this song, especially with that bridge, kind of gets really dark. And then it just immediately it's immediately followed up by this this really beautiful bridge that that kind of just has like this subtle hopefulness to it. I think it's just it's it's kind of for me this kind of perfect peak to the album. better description of it than i was giving so (laughs) so after that leave the lights on this is one of my favorite songs from when i was a kid and i still really like it i don't have a lot to say about it other than you know it's it's kind of a metaphor for growing growing more mature and being less afraid of the unknown and the line from uh, the chorus which is can't decide to open my eyes or wait until the light is kind of great and, and delivered really well here's a big question do you want to talk about superman's son um no <laughs> All right, me too moving on it's just i don't know like a lot of people focus on that song and i'm just like i don't know it's it's fine well but next i don't want to talk about it everybody's gonna ask a question but yeah. nope nope we're nope. good that's it we're not talking about it anymore all right <laughs> So overall, I, you know, one thing that really hit me as, as even today, as I was kind of listen to the album right again, right before we did this, is that kind of just how far the album moves from the beginning to the end. I mean, lyrically, musically, I think even though it has a fairly uniform sound across the whole thing, it still feels like it moves a long distance from the first song to the last song. It covers a lot of ground somehow. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that is, is successful for the album. Otherwise, I like it. I think that Nick's vocals are really good. I, th- I really love the textures of the guitars, kind of w- the way they blend together and kind of the harmonics bounce off of each other, which is a really subtle thing. Overall, I think that it, it, it's missing something that I can't put my finger on, which is probably the reason it didn't get a, n- a bunch of attention in the day, you know, as Spud Puddle or as Quail. And so I don't know what that missing thing is, but I think it, there's just, there's a little lack of something that's not grabbing people all the way. Oh, I would agree with that. And, and you're right. Unfortunately, I can't put my finger on it either because this is really pretty good. And if, especially is. if you look at the evolution from Spud Puddle to this, mm-hmm. it's really good. But you're right. There's just something that doesn't take it to that next level where it really would grab and hook people. Now, yeah. if they had done a third album... Right. That might have done it. Or and not that Mike Knott did a bad job on this because he didn't, but it may be a different job. producer who was 
you know, more hands on and tweak yeah. some of the stuff. I don't know. Yeah, and I don't know. So, like, you know, I was I was going to talk about Mike not, about, you know, when we got to the to the to the uh, you know recording quality, but like, is it one? I'm going to say again that he did a great job. And I keep talking about the I keep talking about the textures of the guitars in this album. It's it's a, it's a really hard thing to do when you have as kind of like fuzzy guitars as there are on this album to bring out those subtleties in them. And I think that Mike and the band really did a really great job in doing that because a lot of what you hear in this album is kind of the subtleties of what's going on in highly distorted guitars and also how they're playing off of each other. A lot of the different the, the different things that, that come out of the album, which are not spoon-fed to you. You know, you have to really kind of like close your eyes and listen to it to really get them. They're, 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 it's, hard to, it's hard to make an album like this and have it sound good, which is the, to say that it's really easy to mess up an album like this. Right. <laughs> and that, that they didn't and that, and that Mike not was able to capture that, I think is, 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 is a, you know, says a lot about him as a producer. Yeah. You know, one thought I had listening to this is this is one of those, and I know you had some notes about this um, too, but I, this is one of those albums where it's definitely not explicitly about God or Christianity. Mm-hmm. And I almost wonder if they would have been better off in the regular kind of market. Yeah. Now, it might have been harder to get signed, sure. you know, and, and put out an album that way. And they'd already put out one as Spud Puddle. But mm-hmm. I I wonder if they actually, this is one of those, some bands do better because they're in the Christian market, like Supertones, great example. Sure. But this one, yeah. I wonder if they were limited by that. Let's look at this in a slightly different perspective, I think, because here, here's where I want to come from it, is that they put out Spud Puddle and Oleum came out on Brainstorm Artists, right? which is an independent label run by Gene Eugene and Joe Taylor. If they weren't in the Christian market, I think they easily could have been on an, on a similar independent label in, in the indie scene. Right. They wouldn't have been on sub pop, but they could have been on, you know, one of those local California labels, the independent labels. Right. Yeah. I think that this album similarly would have fit perfectly fine on, on any of those, any of those smaller labels that we, that, people would have found you know that wouldn't it wouldn't have gotten you know sub pop or jade tree kind of distribution but would have been an album that people did find and did listen to i kind of want to tr- in, in this sense i kind of want to treat the christian market as just to say a small different market kind of like the indie music market right and i think that in that sense brainstorm artists makes a lot more sense than sub than, than sublime does for them and I think them being on Sublime, in a sense, is kind of a kind of a coup on their part. You know, they they, they, kind, of, they kind of got lucky to even get that much distribution because they belonged on an independent record label, which is not to say they're good. They would have been the top. They would have if they had been on like if they had been on one of those small record labels, they might have been one of the best bands on there and gotten a lot of marketing push and and, and support behind them. Right. That's kind of what I'm wondering is if the, just the audience was kind of wrong. Yes. For this. I think definitely so. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, one of the things that I was thinking about, because, because as you mentioned, this is there, there's not a lot of Christianity on this album. And, 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 and Quail is definitely one of my first Christians in a band, not a Christian band experiences, which is a little bit weird because Huntington was, Huntington's were always that way. And it never really hit me until I experienced things like Quail. And I'm like, oh yeah, Huntington's are also like this. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> um, but I think that in a sense, Sub Pop them, did them a favor because it did expose them to the non-Christian market. You mean Sublime. Sublime, sorry. <laughs> okay. Sublime did them a favor because it did expose them to the non-Christian market. But at the same time, it was the wrong market because they would have been better suited for just like people who love indie rock. Yeah. I just I wish these guys had gone on to make more stuff because as you said they, there's so much growth between between linoleum and this album, and I would love to see them. There's also some more rawness on linoleum that I would like to have seen them kind of recapture later on. Some so a lot of bands do that where they kind of polish the edges too much on their second album. Well, and they were so young. I mean, he was so 18 young. when this yes, came. The out. oldest guy was 22. So. I'm honestly for the age, it's really good, especially the fact yes. that the main songwriter is the youngest one. And again, I yeah, I would have loved to have heard more, mm-hmm. just because you know most bands are not hitting their peak until <laughs> mid late twenties or even later. Um, yeah, this 
I would have liked to have seen what would have, you know, yeah, me too. third album. I don't know if anybody knows if there's demos or anything after this. Yeah. It'd be great to share with the world. So what do you think of the uh, artwork and packaging? You know, okay, this this is another thing where I think the label wasn't helping them. Um, mm-hmm. I think it looks a little too polished for what this is. Mm-hmm. And this is a good sounding record. It's not that it's yeah. just, you know, you were comparing it. I mean, even even Foo Fighters at the time, which is obviously very <laughs> polished, like they're, that first album stuff doesn't look as polished on the packaging as this one right. does. And Knapsack and some of those things you're comparing it to. And I think mm-hmm. that's another maybe turn off with the way mm-hmm. it was a little bit packaged. Yeah. And kind of the, I guess the quail is playing off the president, like the red, white, and blue. I think so, on yeah. The cover. And then the back thing with a photo of the band is definitely too... I guess polish is the best way I can think about yeah, it. Yeah, I think I think the the picture of the band on the back is kind of funny because it is like these nerds, you know, taking a picture like 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 some high gloss, uh, pretty boy uh, pop band, you know. Yeah, so I know you've done some research on this, Clifton. Where are they now? All right, so I'm going to pick this story up where I left off earlier. That Daily Titan article that I mentioned earlier was from uh, May of 1998. So the he actually said that that they hadn't really earned anything; they just got signed because they were catchy. He actually said that after this album was released, um, <laughs> not just the first one, but this one was released. But in that, it says that the band's about to go on a national tour. It also says that the bassist William Coker is a former member of the band, and he's doing graphic design for bands like the Israelites and the Supertones at that time. Um, as I said, I think these guys are in college at this point, so I, I don't think they're doing full-time band. I think they're doing band on the weekends. I think they're doing band during spring break and summer like that. I think that's why they have kind of a limited tour schedule. I did see somewhere that they went on a, a short, like, one-week tour of Japan. Um, I only found that in one place. And then about the time that you would think that you would see another, another album coming out from them, Sublime ceases to exist. Hmm. So, and the people talking about Sublime, there wasn't a lot of reason given to why Sublime ceased to exist. It sounded like it just wasn't getting as much traction fast as they thought they would, which to me is stupid because I, th- I think they were doing great as a label. They just need to stick with it a little bit more. I've read somewhere, and I couldn't find it again when after I read it, but I read somewhere that Nick attempted a solo career after this. And Nick has a song on the Bounce motion picture soundtrack from 2000 called My Baby and Me. Did you get a chance to listen to the song? I did a little bit. It's, it's much yeah. more chill it is. than this, but it's not bad. No, I, I thought it was a good refinement, kind of even more of, of of this same style. But it's part of his. I think it's part of his ta- take on a solo career. So I actually did order that. That that song wasn't available anywhere. So I did order that CD just to get that one song. Wow. Off it. So interestingly and sadly, in an interview from just last year, 2020, with Frank Lintz. That's that how you say his name, Lintz. Um, I don't know. Either way, sure. <laughs> Star 529, Lassie Foundation, he's a drummer. He talks about being present when Gene Eugene died in 2000 and that they were recording something with Nick Garcy at the same time. And that's in the timeline for it to be that song from Bounce. Interesting. Okay. In a May 2004 review of this album on Amazon, user William T. Coker, who happens to have the same name as the bass player, says, I love this CD because I played bass on it. <laughs> you can check out our new project, Royale, at royalemusic.com. Same guys, new tunes. Thanks for the 4.5 stars, all six of you. So, it would appear these guys changed their name again. <sighs> Why? Yeah. But I guess they were still playing together in 2004. I would, like you said, I would, I would be fascinated to, he- to hear something from that. You know, new songs, new recordings, anything, honestly. But I can't find anything from there. That website's obviously gone. 
I'm looking Internet Archive right now at Royale Music, and there are a few things. But um, oh, you found something? Uh, it, back in 2005, and there are some MP3s, but of course you can't download them. You know, yeah. yeah. But they had a song called "Heather, Don't Make Me an Ex Girlfriend," <laughs> <laughs> which would have been nice to hear. So yeah, but I can't see much other than just a little bit of text. All right, if anyone has those MP3s, we'd love to hear them. I'm 95 percent sure that I found Nick's LinkedIn page. And it says that he works for Sony Music. And it appears that he has or had, I don't know, a band called Scores, which released an EP on Bandcamp in 2013. It's good. It's kind of still in the indie thing, but it's more acoustic. Like if you if you mix indie with Songs Ohio, I think that's gonna give you a good idea of of, of where it is, you know, acoustic and keys, but still in that indie indie rock genre. But a little more adulty. So what's the award for this album, Clifton? I'm going to give this album the Warm Fuzzy Safety Blanket for Angsty Teens Award. It it <laughs> is an actual old blanket and it and it hasn't been washed in like a couple years. So it smells a bit worse than Teen Spirit, but it is something to be proud of. So thank you guys, Quail, Spud Puddle, Royale, whoever you are. Nice, that was a good award. <laughs> I'm going to have to up my game. <laughs> So what are we listening to next time, Clifton? You know what, okay, so here's what I, I, I have something that I want to do. Okay. You ready for this? Uh, maybe. <laughs> Extraordinary by Johnny Q Public. <laughs> okay, fair. It's also on Spotify, so I, I, oh, I'll good. make it easier. A lot easier. Um, and, I, and I think, I was just thinking as we were doing this, I was like, we should do something more Christian. Yes next time because i i want to dig i'm having fun digging into the lyrics and this one was a little Mm -hmm. bit harder to dig into so yeah good idea let's do that one you know what i did this week jay what clifton i checked our email and what was there nothing oh i mean spam oh they already found it wow yeah i know so fast nobody's emailed us yet and i if they had it would have been until now that i remember to check it anyways so Good on us. But you know what is interesting? We got a Facebook message from a listener who said that they had never heard Loudflower and they appreciated getting exposed to it. Well, that's nice. That's really yeah. good. Yeah. Hmm. So thank you guys for listening and uh, next time. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Your Music Saved Us. If you enjoyed us, nope. <laughs> if you enjoyed your time, please leave us a review or share this episode on the social media of your choice, where you can probably follow us at Your Music Saved Us, or email us at yourmusicsavedus at gmail.com. The music in this episode is the work of Quail and is used with apologies, not permission. Yeah, go listen to Nick's band scores on Bandcamp, link in the show notes. Do we want to record something like that or do we do we want to just keep that? <laughs> <laughs> um